Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming out. Um, so who are we? This is a great question. So we're members of Women Photograph, and we're going to be talking tonight about personal projects and what motivates us and also how we are able to make this work happen. Um, at the end, we will be doing a Q&A, so please think of things that you would like us to talk about. Um, so thank you to Adorama for having us and for our photo brigade for putting this all together. Um, so Women Photograph is an initiative that was launched in 2017. And the idea is to elevate women, gender nonconforming, transgender, and gender queer visual journalists. Um, so right now it's a database of seven, over 700 independent female journalists in 91 countries. Um, so in addition to a website where you can see our work and also a searchable database that editors can have, it's also um, an organization that offers project grants, mentorship programs, and a travel fund. Um, the idea is to shift the gender makeup of photojournalism in our community so that we're as diverse as the communities we hope to represent. Those are Daniela's words, not mine. <laughs> um, so we're really grateful to be here and really grateful to be part of this uh, group of, of visual journalists that are trying to make this shift, much needed shift in our industry. So what we're going to do is we're going to each take about five minutes to introduce ourselves and show you a little bit of one of our personal projects and then we'll just have a conversation um, about some of the work. I'm first. Hello everyone, I'm Kathy Shore, and my project is SHOT that I'm talking about tonight, 101 Survivors of Gun Violence in America. And the project took a little over two years to complete, and it is a diverse representation of people who get shot, which is just about everyone. Um, they are aged 8 to 80, all races, many ethnicities, high and low profile shootings, gun owners, and an NRA member are in the project. And um, it was, I've always asked if this was, a, how did I do this project, that it must have been so sad to be confronted with this on an almost daily basis, photographing people. And I think the project to me was extremely uplifting. The survivors that I photographed were, had terrible circumstances for um, the situations that they were in where they were shot, but they as people were anything but um, depressing or sad. They were remarkable, and every time I left someone, I couldn't believe that they had gone through this trauma, emotional and physical, and were out there doing incredible things. I, many times I felt like I wasn't doing enough after being with someone who um, you know, had seven kids, was working full time, writing and doing all kinds of things, and I felt like, wow, the, what, what am I doing that, that compares with this? So I'll just talk about a few of the people that are up here. This is Isaiah from Milwaukee. And he was probably, he said, one of the saddest things to me of all the people that I photographed. He was about six foot five, and um, I had to s make him sit on a bench. Oh, also, um, I photographed most of the people where they were shot at the location. So Isaiah was shot on two separate occasions, and he told me that he was afraid of the dark. He was afraid to go out at night. And I think that that was one of the most profound things that I actually heard from someone I, and didn't, felt like the conversation had, went, uh, had gone from talking to a young man about 25 to me speaking with a five-year-old and hearing that. It was very sad. So that was an example of something where I, I didn't feel like it, it was such a happy ending or somebody that had really gone beyond that, but for the most part, most of the people in the project um, had gone through, had pushed through that, and it could have been because maybe he had been shot uh, very recently, about a year in. Um, okay, this is Megan. She's the cover of the book. This is the book. It was published by Powerhouse in 2017. She was shot uh, in Miami and shot while in city, seated in the back seat of a car, and actually was a hero because she jumped on top of a little boy and prevented him from being shot. Um, this is Karina, who was shot in uh, Aurora, Colorado, outside of her high school, one time in the back and was paralyzed. 
um, Marlis, uh, I think was the oldest person in the project. She's from uh, Canoga Park, California, and her husband of 41 years shot her in the heart. So that was a, um, Marlis had met him when she was 13, married when she was 15, and thought that men acted like this. This was, you were abused by your husband or boyfriend. That, that, that many of the people in the project are domestic violence survivors, I think about 20 percent. And that is, um, I found, a situation where that crosses all color lines, socioeconomic, domestic violence happens to all kinds of women, and it's very, f it's filled with cliches, really. Um, most of the people heard uh, from their partner that if I can't have you, no one can. So it was, uh, um, that was one of the um, situations that really affected me as a woman, and I felt that I wanted to have as many domestic violence survivors as possible in the project. So, um, let's see, and the gun owner, this is Sarah, I'm sorry, she was shot as a teenager in New Orleans when her um, mother went in to get uh, something in a gas station and a convicted uh, felon who had just gotten out of prison hijacked the car and took her along and shot her in the head. So there, the project has all different circumstances. We have um, the Bishop of Salt Lake City is in the project. There's a prostitute, an ex-prostitute in the project, former gang members, and people from all walks of life. The NRA member is a, um, a upper middle class person from Memphis, and the idea of the project was not to be political, but to have people start talking about gun violence as something that affects all of us and that we need to do something about it. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Kalud. I am a documentary photographer and a teacher. Um, and I kind of wanted to focus a little bit more on uh, how I came to this project. It's different than other things I've done, um, kind of going back to how I came upon it. So um, I focused on uh, Afro-Colombian women in uh, Choco, which is um, a northwestern region. It's among the poorest in Colombia. Um, and I thought about doing this project because uh, well, IWMF, International Women's Media Foundation, funded the project. Uh, they'll put out, uh, they put out initiatives, uh, grants, um, uh, travel, uh, travel workshops and whatnot. And um, so they put out uh, a call for Colombia and El Salvador. And I was uh, very intrigued by Colombia, partly because um, growing up Palestinian American, um, you know, I know what it's like. I've lived in Palestine for three years when I was younger, and I know what it's like to come from a region that's so closely tied with the connotation of war and conflict. Uh, and, but I, I don't speak uh, the language. I don't know Colombia very well. And so that was really nerve-wracking for me because it was my first time going into a project where I was very much an outsider, um, and I, you know, kind of going back to the teaching aspect of my work, you know, I have a lot of conversations with students about the insider versus outsider perspectives, um, and they both have merits, there's pros and cons, um, but uh, IWMF put out uh, this very general, you know, we want stories that fall within women, peace, and security, so, um, you know, I looked at, I did research and uh, looked at Afro-Colombian women um, in politics at first, um, and I saw that Piedad Cordoba had recently announced her bid for, uh, to run for presidency, uh, and I was really, I just had the idea of women's roles in politics in the U.S. election um, was very fresh in my mind. Uh, this project, I, I did it last year, and uh, so those are things that I was thinking of um, when I when I kind of came onto the project. And for me, sometimes when I follow follow project, and I might be meandering right now, but uh, 
you know, you find new angles and you find new stories once you hit the ground, and that's kind of what it was. I very quickly uh, switched gears from wanting to focus on politics to wanting to focus on uh, women who were active in some way, socially active, um, in bettering their own lives and the lives of others uh, in their communities. Um, the issues that they face are unique to the rest of Colombia in that over 50% of this population is internally displaced. Uh, many of the women featured in this project have been uh, victims of sexual violence. They've had children who've been victims of sexual violence. Uh, there's a high uh, unemployment rate, high levels of infant mortality, uh, low education standards. So these are um, things that kind of helped guide me in finding who I would tell stories uh, on. And talking to some of the older women um, and then kind of shifting gears and speaking to the younger women, um, the younger women were telling me that they were glad that I was kind of covering the basis of ages because they tend to internalize and, um, and respond to the conflict in different ways. A lot of the younger women that I was um, photographing and interviewing, they turned to the arts. Um, they created, one woman featured in this project, um, created a safe space for uh, kids to come and um, as a small theater group. All the kids come from violent neighborhoods and violent separate from guerrilla and, and paramilitary warfare. Um, so those are things that kind of guided my project and my mindset. And, and then I came across other things as far as repre representation. They discussed um, the idea of beauty among um, Afro-Columbian uh, women and, and how it's not reflected in mainstream media. And, and again, it was just, for me, it was important to look at, I think a lot of times war is told and conflict regions are told from a male-dominated narrative. And so I wanted to explore uh, the women's perspectives and, and their lives solely because I think sometimes they're often reduced to just consequences of men's wars. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Mu Yi. Uh, so I'm a photographer, a videographer, and an editor. Right now my job is uh, a, uh, the visuals editor at China File, which is an online publication that reporting on China under uh, Asia Society's U.S.-China Center. Uh, and bef uh, before I moved to U.S. last year, I was uh, ma um, mainly doing reporting in China. Um, so I, I am very interested in the policy that carried on the national level, how it influences people's daily life. And among all the policies uh, that China has made that uh, I'm particularly interested in one-child policy, uh, which is which is uh, which started from uh, 1980 and kind of ended uh, changed into this two child policy in 2015 and I am a result of that I'm the only child and my mom had um, like three times abortion after me because she couldn't afford fine um, that's why I'm very interested in the topic um, and um, so here are two stories that are like phenomenon that you can see in China uh, that is kind of like the result of that. This is a story that um, this, you know, like when, when you have this one child policy um, and they actually allow people in uh, rural to, if they first kid is a girl, they can have the second kid. So many people do like gender selection while they're having the second kid. So there is this like uh, 30 million uh, single man that cannot find wife in China. Um, we have this like huge gender imbalance in China. So here, of course, you know, like uh, the market driven by the demand and we have this a lot of men in rural China and needs to find a wife. And this guy actually got a lot of pressure from his family. So he went online and tried to rent a girlfriend mm -hmm. to, to kind of, you know, to make his family happy. And um, I happen to know this girl on my social network, and uh, not, not this one, this is another story. This is a child marriage also because of the gender imbalance. So like um, that 30 year old man, like uh, he find this girl in um, online and uh, they went back together on Spring Festival, which is Chinese New Year. And then the, ma uh, the mom is very happy. 
Um, and I pitched this story. Like I found this, the girl is in my connection, uh, is is on my social media friend. I don't really know her in person. And you know, she's, she has this spirit of adventure and she offered to be rented because she know there's this market. She kind of want to just like try, try it out. And then she found this man and they had this agreement, signed a contract and I got access, I got agreement from both of them. But the story is very tricky because it's kind of reporting on a lie. You can't really like, um, when you go reporting, you can't really let the parents find it out or the story won't be the story. So um, I was, I, I, I feel like I need some kind of guideline. So I pitched a story to Reuters, which is someone that I used to work for as well. Um, and they have this very high uh, ethical standard and they helped me a lot of like, uh, you know, how to carry out the story. Basically like, uh, I can't, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to pun uh, publish this story unless if one day, for any reason that is not involved with me, that the parents find it out the truth, uh, and it eventually happened, which is half years later, and we can we can see the story online now. Um, and another, yeah, this, sure. yeah, okay. So this, um, so this is the another story is the child marriage that I uh, shoot in two thousand fifteen. Uh, which is also because, you know, like in, in rural China, people in a very poor place, people get married when they're like 13. This girl here is 13 and she's pregnant and his, uh, his husband is like uh, 18 year old. And, you know, like the men were under a lot of pressure if you are not uh, married by the age of 18. So, you know, so you kind of hurry up when you're in uh, primary school. I found this kind of like love letter in their, um, like primary school textbook, which is like kind of crazy. And then, um, but they don't really know how to raise up a kid. And what they do is like, they will be there for their kid for two years. And then by the time they reach like 18, they will move to bigger cities to work as migrant workers. And then their kid will become this like left alone kid, left behind children, and will be taken care of by their grandparents. So. Uh, here is a photo that the four-year-old kid is like video chatting with their, his parents that he has not seen for like four years. Yeah, not four years, two years, I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, yeah, so that's basically the things I'm um, very interested in and I will keep uh, shooting stories around this one-child policy and the results of that. Um, there are like four seats up front, so if any of you in the back want to come up here, there are some <laughs> spots for you. <coughs> I'm not looking at my phone to check my text. I'm mm -hmm. timekeeping, so in case that seems rude. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All good. Um, so I'm Alice Projansky, and I'm a documentary photographer covering um, birth, work, motherhood, and identity. Um, I'm showing two pieces of projects. The first one partly to plug the International Women's Media Foundation. Um, I also went on a trip with them. So any of you who are female identifying journalists, um, they have these group reporting trips. So these photographs are from, the first one is from a group reporting trip that I did to Chiapas, so the Guatemala-Mexico border. Um, it was about eight journalists and it's a really great way, sort of as Kalud was experiencing, to get to know a place that you haven't reported from extensively. Um, so I started a project there about the impact of U.S. immigration policy on Latin American families, especially adolescents. Um, so this was in Chiapas. And then um, from that, I received another grant from IW IWMF to continue this project on my own. And I went to Tijuana to photograph children whose parents had been deported. Um, so this kid is from California, and he speaks English, and he's very, like, culturally Mexican-American and is really struggling to um, adapt to living in Tijuana, which he has no connection to. And then this is also from the first piece of the project in Chiapas. And now I'm photographing, um, I live in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. Um, so I'm also a teaching artist through Aperture and I teach in a school where many of my students are Mexican, um, first or second generation kids. Um, and the impetus for this project came from my students being really scared that their parents would be deported and from some of them having had parents deported. Um, we'll talk further about what motivates us, but for me it was just uh, outrage at someone coming for my students and hurting their families. Um, and then the other project that I want to show is, these are out of order, that's fine. We'll go through birth backwards. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I also do a lot of stories for the past 12 years or so about birth and culture around the world. 
Um, and now I'm working on stories about birth in the US. So this is the only industrialized nation with a rising rate of maternal mortality. Um, Native American women and African American women are three times as likely to die um, in childbirth and in the year after that as white women are. And those uh, disparities cut across um, income levels, they cut across education levels, they cut across lifestyle levels. So there are a number of um, activists working on this that are looking at the effects of structural racism and access through healthcare. This woman is obviously, well not obviously, this woman is white. Um, and so the focus of this story was about a different program at this hospital, but basically this is one of the midwives who happened to have a baby while I was on assignment, so I photographed it. <laughs> um, and this was something I did on assignment for Lifetime, which you also did a story for them. So they recently did a project about women in all 50 states that was really great to work on. Um, so the point of this project is looking at the ways that our culture does and doesn't look at women, especially our naked or working bodies, and the way that we lack uh, cultural narratives around birth that could help us understand it. So instead, we sort of are afraid of it or tend to um, overly medicalize it or make it into something, uh, a perfectionist uh, fantasy. So I want to show what it's really like, um, the struggle and the beauty and the difficulty and the intensity of it, um, just showing birth as I really see it, especially um, trying to help women access safe, respectful, evidence-based, culturally appropriate care, especially women who otherwise wouldn't be able to access that kind of work. Do I have like one minute left? Yeah. Okay. Um, and f in this case, I think photography is really essential in helping us shape these narratives and change the way that we do this. Photography is really powerful. It can be for good or ill. And in this um, approach, I really want to look at birth and also migration stories in this way that's uh, intimate and also very like factual and evidence-based. So those are two personal projects. Oh, I have more time. I have yeah. more stuff to say. <laughs> um, so more basically there. the overarching interest to me is in women and labor, whether that's labor giving birth or just the work that we do. So that can be migration. Um, a lot of the people that I met who were doing the physical labor of migration were women trying to keep their families safe. Um, and then also the emotional labor that a lot of the women do in the migration situation. Um, and then also looking at like our careers, I did a project on working motherhood, and then also birth stuff. So we'll be talking more about women's work tonight, so that's sort of apropos. Um, okay, so I'm gonna cycle through all of these. So we just had a couple of topics that we want to touch on, and so please uh, think of other things you'd like us to discuss. But one question was just sort of how, I guess we talked a little bit about this, but how did any of us come up with these ideas? I think we spoke a little bit about that, but is there anything else that you wanted to talk to us about sort of generally about how you come up with a personal project before you start it? Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I have to be interested in something. I mean, I, I'm not gonna do a project if I don't have an interest in it. And um, that can come from, you know, many different things. It just doesn't click. And sure sorry, sorry. It, um, it's just not something that happens. For me, it takes a while. And then actually starting a project, I'm currently, I think, three or four months in talking to people to allow them allow them they'll they'll allow me to photograph so this is four months of just um meetings and talking why do you want to do this this isn't for shop this is for something different but it's a lot of um prep work i think the photographing itself sometimes takes less time than the actual research and the prep to do a project yeah i've definitely found that and it uh, so when you're starting projects, are you interested in, shot sounds like something, I could be wrong, but that came from uh, something that you were noticing in the culture that you wanted to make visual. Uh, how much of what you do or what you do comes from, you know, noticing something that's happening, maybe like an interesting statistic, and how much comes from like, I need to see this, like this is a very visually interesting topic, or both? Well, shot was a combination of things. I myself was um, robbed at gunpoint. I've had a gun pointed in my face, and my daughter was a toddler at the time. So I know what it feels like to have a gun pointed at me. I also have a family member that was killed by his best friend. And um, I have shootings in my psyche, I guess, but part of me. But I also teach, and um, I would always see students with uh, memorial cards on. 
And I started thinking about that as something, well, how come we only hear about dead people? Uh, what happens to all the people that survive these things? I never hear anybody say anything about survivors. So I thought of them as a group, as a very interesting um, exploration to start talking to survivors and uh, the fact that they're supposed to pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and move on with their lives is kind of how we treat them. And they were also very um, faceless. And I thought if I could bring a face and a humanness to this, that we could look at gun violence in a different way rather than statistics, which are cold and have no meaning for most people. And this was in, uh, the, at the end of 2013. So this was a while ago when I started the project. So Muyi, were you, was your project driven by your interest in this, you know, you were talking about the one child policy. Were you interested in like a specific moment or was it just something that you really needed to make visual? Um, I think um, I first started to get really interested in one child policy because uh, I have a friend who just who has a brother and tell me that uh, the closest relationship you have in your life is actually siblings because they are the person who can accompany you through your whole life not your parents because parents will mm -hmm. only be your first half life and your partner will be yours if you have a partner you will be, have the uh, second half of life but then I was like wow so I missed a big thing <laughs> so I and then I started to look into uh, one child policy you know what caused me that I'm the only child at home and then uh, I think a very important part uh, also, uh, back to your question how I found my story is like when I'm interested in a policy bigger policy I, I think I tend to do like very uh, thorough research mm -hmm. uh, like I, I read a lot of papers you know thesis you know like the one child policy yeah I know the description of it like when does it start when does it like end but then like what it really like what is the really result result like for example the uh, gender gender choice and also like right now the demographic transition into the aging society because you know like the young people kind of get less and then so you have all these old people like all this used to be mid-age people like get old so we have this like um, very aging society that is actually the reason the country started two child policy right now so like I think I'm just very curious about the connections between the you know, the phenomena I see in daily life, but they are all like dots you can connect it together that linked back to a bigger picture. So um, maybe I'm not gonna spend like five years just like every, every day go photograph like um, kind of, um, of this kind of vague idea of one child policy because a policy is mm -hmm. a very too big of subject to photograph almost yeah. so i rather like started to you know like because i know what is the results though so, so i start from those results and go find stories mm -hmm. like within that topic yeah so yeah. it's both of you are talking about sort of from the you know going from this big idea, big idea down yeah and down things. to this yeah yeah, yeah. so Ludo, how about you um i think for for the columbia project there are a few things that really uh stuck out at me that that kind of piqued my interest um one is I've always been interested in like the concept of home and the fact that um, so many of these women are internally displaced uh, was a different way of exploring that issue. Um, and again, kind of going back to uh, talking a little bit about um, how women are, are portrayed in conflict zones, um, I think, uh, it, I just think it's important to show you know, it's not necessarily like, hey, this is a feel-good story because they've all gone through such horrific experiences, mm -hmm. but it's the fact that I think that it's possible in journalism to highlight the positive while still acknowledging um, the issue at hand. Yeah. I think it doesn't have to be all gloom and doom and despair. Um, I think it could be like, oh, look, these women are being proactive. What are the issues that they are addressing? Um, I spent the better part of this past year editing this work because um, even though it was a short period of time I only worked on it for a few weeks which is the shortest I've done usually I like to really spend a lot of time on a project um, and I'd love to go back but I just dipped in and out of all of these different small stories so they're essentially different vignettes um, and you know Me Too has come up in the past year and one thing that has really been on my mind when I look at this work is like these women have been outspoken uh, in really dangerous circumstances and they've been 
pushing to better their conditions uh, without the help of social media and hashtags and trending topics. Uh, and I still think that on some level, uh, on a lot of levels, they're overlooked. Um, you know, they lack a lot of the resources that the rest of Colombia has, even though they are the richest in natural resources. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, those are just things. And for me in general, when I approach a project, a personal project, there's almost always, uh, of course, you know, I have to be interested in it. Um, I mentioned like the insider outsider kind of thing. Uh, even though there were still elements that I could personally relate to for this project, it was the most outsider approach uh, mm -hmm. I've done thus far. And so, yeah, for me, a lot of times I have to, there's some aspect of me or my life or, or issues that resonate personally that um, I'll, those are things that I kind of trail off and, and go and explore and, and research. Yeah. Um, right, the sort of like, I don't want to call it solutions journalism, because I think it's a very specific term, but that's mm -hmm. something that interests me too in the birth photographs, is there are people that are, like this is a very, the statistics for maternal health in the U.S. are pretty dire for a country that has the, you know, access to health care that we do. But there are people that are doing things that are working, and so I'd like to go and photograph that and see what's working, partly because mm -hmm. it's not something that we see that much, and I right. think it sort of like changes perceptions, and that's a strength of photography. Well, how did you come to the birthing project specifically? Because you've been working on that for a while. I started photographing just birthing culture around the world because I went to the Dominican Republic in 2006 and photographed in a hospital where things were just really not working. Like, it was very bad. They didn't have access to the training or the materials that they needed. And so I started being like, this is not this is not good, but I'm sort of uncomfortable with the way, as much as I'm being careful about it, the way that I'm portraying as like a white American journalist going and portraying women in the developing world in this situation where they're, they are greatly at risk, like they are not powerful, except for the fact that birth is an incredibly powerful thing, which is why it's an interesting kind of public health thing for me to photograph, because you are simultaneously like, n you definitely need to be supported and to have people intervene if something goes wrong but you're also incredibly powerful so like that was interesting to me that little thread of it was interesting and so I wanted to photograph people in other places where things were difficult like I photographed in Lagos I photographed in Mexico I photographed in the Navajo Nation but where there were really successful interventions happening and what I was seeing over and over was it was this like integrated care between midwives and doctors that it was evidence-based it was culturally relevant the women had informed consent and so to me, that was like, that became the theme of the project. And that was before I had children. I have gone through this experience of giving birth. And like, the, like we, we have all been talking about how our personal experiences impacted our work. But in that case, my work impa impacted my personal experience because I had sought out these stories and this narrative that I lacked. And that it was powerful for me. And I would like that other people to have that too. Mm. I'm also very interested in solution journalism since you just brought it up. Uh, I'm just having a question for you. Do you find like sometimes people do you pay less attention to your stories that is about like um, success or I, I, I don't know, like question. that's something that I. Well, I think that's probably yeah. changed a lot too over the past year mm -hmm. when the news has become so totally overwhelming and a source of like not just information but of just of trauma, <laughs> sort of secondary, just being overwhelmed by it, I guess. Um, but no, if it, but if, if it's something that's just like, you can sort of feel it, right? Where it's a story that's like, check out this amazing tech invention that's gonna revolutionize healthcare in Western Africa. You're like, this to me feels like a press release. I don't think that this makes any sense. It feels sort of, has sort of like an imperialist tone right. that you're just like, ah, this is not, this does not, well, not what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about the women that you photographed, you know, or the people that you're photographing, like what, if it's something that it feels like people are actually doing something and where, as you talked about doing all this research behind it, where I've nerded out on birthing, you know, journal articles and I'm like, yeah, this feels like it's evidence-based. I think that I wanna talk about this. That feels, I feel like that's the difference between like recycling a press release and doing mm -hmm. solution. Not that I'm an expert right. in solutions journalism, but that kind of more useful stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it has like an, uh, a negative connotation. When people hear solution journalism, they think like, yeah, like it's um, kind of watered down, feel good, like here you go, press release esque. And I think that, you know, maybe solution journalism, it's not the, the best title, or maybe it is, but I think that there are ways of, of delving into the issues of community while still acknowledging, celebrating, and highlighting the successes or the people who are. Um, present and, and trying to do something about their situations. 
I, yeah. I don't think really any photo story is going to be a solution. No. No. I think it's going to add to the dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, the best yeah. we can hope for, really, I think. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, f like from, f uh, from my understanding, like uh, solution journalism should be mm, not about that, okay, this is the solution, but you provide it as a possibility of one of the solutions and then talk about, uh, you know, like which part is working, which part is not. Almost like a visually, a visual representation of like uh, this, like, you know, in social science, there's this like evaluation of intervention program. So like you actually, uh, because those social social science papers very hard to read, so you actually give them like a very solid but like easier to digest kind of way to see the. Yeah. So you were a Magnum Foundation Social Justice Fellow. Is that the name of the? Uh, yeah, right now it's called that. Before, oh uh, yeah, there's another fellow here. So <laughs> yeah, we uh, at that time we were called Human Rights and. So yeah. w is that part of what you were studying, like what you were examining in that fellowship? Uh, at uh, when we at that year, no. But then, like uh, two years later, in 2016, like uh, Magnum Foundation assembled all the human rights fellows, mm -hmm. and then we had this like two year, uh, no, two day like a uh, two day meeting, and we just discussed like. Or like the depressing, like the things you said, like the overwhelming depressing news that in journalism that we only see like negative things, but we have no idea how to work them out. And then like we just like kind of spend this two day discuss, okay, what are we gonna do? And then after in the end of the two day, we like we just found that yeah, we gotta talk about solutions as well. Mm -hmm. And then so we did this. Um, they started this like group project called What Works. Um, so they asked all the uh, human rights fellows to submit these uh, story pitches that you think it is working uh, in the community that you are in. At that time, I was in U.S. studying, and then everyone pitched a small story uh, about you know like that time the topic is like uh, bridging communities so uh, to fight against you know extremism extremism yeah so. Um, yeah, and then they select nine stories and everyone go back to shoot. Uh, they gave us like half a year. First we shoot uh, f like uh, three months and then they got together all the nine fellows to New York and got this like 10 days workshop. Mm -hmm. That is the place that we actually had this teacher come in uh, and talk about solution journalism, mm -hmm. which helped us a lot yeah like to understand why we're doing that what is really like about solution journalism right. like what is the point of doing that yeah. yeah yeah that also segues into the question that i know some of you are going to ask so let me get there first <laughs> is how do we fund these projects um and so we've mentioned the international women's media foundation which i hope you all know about um yes. the magnum foundation has various fellowships and then photography expanded workshops and symposiums um, there's the Pulitzer Center. I've received a grant from them. What are some other sources that you would think our audience should know about for funding these projects? Aside Did from just teaching. <laughs> yeah. um, how about your savings account? <laughs> yeah. Which one? <laughs> I um, used my savings to do. If you believe in something, you have to go for it. Um, and midway through the project, I didn't expect to have any attention until I completed it. And midway, um, David Rosenberg from Slate saw some images and he said, can I um, put them in Slate? And I was like, okay, I didn't expect this. And it kind of went from there. Uh, I was up to the, like the 50th person and um, I had publicity for the whole rest of the time. So good thing was that um, Japanese, uh, magazines, German magazines pay. So I was able, you know, the, the Americans really don't pay, but they <laughs> did. So I was able to kind of get my hotel and airfare back by um, publishing work. But um, I think I also got one grant as I was doing the book, but it was very small. But I really think that um, I know that some people will say, oh, oh, I guess she can say that, but no, I, I don't have a lot of money, but I think that you have to put your money um, on the line if you believe in something. Borrow it, just do it, because um, it, if, you do, if you believe in it, you'll do a good job and it will be worth it. With the birth stuff, I've ended up sort of stringing together. Well, I started off by, I'm a teaching artist and always have been. Um, and so I would work during the year and save up enough money to go on one trip a year. And so it took a really, really long time, like staying with people. And I 
wasn't able to really pull it off otherwise, but I've ended up sh shooting a lot of stuff locally and then eventually got to the point where I was getting grants. But also I've ended up doing these assignments where I often will like pitch something that I've researched really extensively that will be get me into a place that will start to become part of this project. So while it's not, I guess, strictly personal work, because it's not just me only doing it for myself, um, there's this whole, it's become this whole body of work that's, pardon the pun, about women's bodies and about sort of our uh, women at different spots along the reproductive spectrum. So women seeking abortion care, or women having access to these, um, you know, birth experiences that I've gotten to photograph. So it can be kind of a mix of things. Mm -hmm. But in order to get that work, I did start like a personal body of work um, first before we yeah. Yeah, got there. Yeah, I also have some, uh, like my experience mainly, I just, if I have some story idea, I just sometimes just go pitch to a publication, like um, because the fellowships at grants, I think they are very limited out there and they just select one or two pe person like every year, but there are so many publications out there and everyone wants good story. Mm -hmm. So like if you're, uh, maybe if your work is not like um, need to do like three years or if you just like more like a feature story then maybe uh, once you have the access because right now I'm an editor and I know that like if you I wish if some photographer you know if you have good story idea and you kind of have idea where you can get access then just go talk to the editor and like if they like the story they will just uh, support you to do the uh, project maybe then you will have a little bit like strict uh, restriction on the um, you know, like the rights you have, because you won't be like if you are supported um, by a uh, um, foundation, then you own all the rights and you can resell it many, many times. I'm not too sure many, uh, every publication is different. Um, so, but they do at least like you, uh, the good part of it is, is you have like a very stable editor to work with. You have a whole system to help you so that you have more guidance through the whole uh, production procedure rather than you just like work completely by yourself and people can make, make mistakes and we see a lot of the examples of that yeah the funding um, the funding is a touchy subject sometimes because when I talk to my peers about it um, you know we kind of vent about how thankfully we're finally having the discussion right now like in photojournalism about um, like the gender disparity and the lack of diversity but we're not really talking about the socioeconomic aspect mm -hmm. of it and how there are a lot of photographers, regardless of what stage they are in their career, because there are definitely people with all sorts of awards that still struggle to pay rent. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really hard to do a personal project, and even to be motivated to do a personal project when you have those kinds of concerns. And so um, that's something that I just definitely want to make note of. Um, and again, also stress, grants are amazing. They're there aren't that many, but I think you could also get creative with who you reach out to um, and editors. I mean, I also, I've received um, a grant through Economic Hardship Reporting Project last year, uh, so they're really great. And, you know, there, there are other small organizations. Um, I cannot sing IWF their praises enough because they also have, one thing that I often like to tell people is that they have an emergency grant to emergency fund, um, and that's, specifically to help uh, women journalists who are in trouble in some aspect. And so if you're in a situation uh, where you feel endangered in some way, um, you can reach out to IWMF for that help. And that's, that's something that not many organizations provide. And that's something that's really commendable. Um, but yeah, I, um, more often than not, it starts on your own dime. And whether that means like, Teaching, uh, you know, I would joke about how like teaching is like my lucrative income right. <laughs> for a while. It's like, what did I do with my life? Um, but you know, and and waitressing and and shooting assignments, and then yeah, when you get an assignment that overlaps with um, this, a subject matter that you're passionate about, like that's that's great when like the planets align that way and you can use it to your advantage. I mean, why not? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, it seems to me like maybe three. I'm sure there are more, but three sort of models that I've noticed people using. So people like Monique. She lives somewhere really interesting. She lives in Turkey, so she's close to places where a lot of things are happening. She's able to work. I'm going to put all your secrets out there. She's <laughs> able to work with NGOs. She's able to get assignments. She's located somewhere where, you know, she's central, and she has these relationships. In New York, there are way too many of us. The upside is there's all this amazing connection and inspiration and the community, which is really helpful in this kind of field. And then also, like we were saying, well, three of us have mentioned now that we teach, and I've always had these parallel careers because I wasn't, my parents are, Lovely, but they weren't able to 
support my photo career. Mm -hmm. And so um, at first I thought, oh, this is so frustrating that I have to do other things. I just always want to be photographing. But then I realized that being a teaching artist is incredible. And it's really wonderful and it's its own set of skills. And it is a way to, mm -hmm. I don't think enough young photographers know about this. I'm always saying this, <laughs> that it's a, it, there are many nonprofits that do this work. You have to be good at it. It takes a lot out of you, but it's, it's a really wonderful way to have these parallel careers and not mm -hmm. only have to worry about assignments. Because when I wasn't doing enough teaching and I was just trying to rely on the crazed ups and downs of freelance life, it's so, so stressful. Yes. And as you guys were saying, how do you even have the motivation when you're just really stressed out about mm -hmm. how you're going to pay mm -hmm. your rent constantly? You're an editor. You know, I think, no, I I think many of better. us aren't upfront <laughs> enough about the fact that we have like multiple hustles intertwined mm -hmm. in this. Um, do you also want to talk a little more about any, I know you talked a little bit about like the pitching and the getting things published. Is there anything else you want to say about that for, for our personal work, any of you? How did you get your book published? <laughs> I know that's something a lot of people want and it's really, it's really unusual to be able to do that. I've been very uh, fortunate. I have probably over 90 stories on the project. I have a lot of press and people always say to me, who's your PR person? Who, who helped you? And it's like, you're looking at her. <laughs> me, I did it all. And um, the thing is, once it starts going, it goes. So um, I had always wanted to do a book, and um, we put together a maquette and took it to Powerhouse, and they said yes. That's great. Yeah. And how long was the process of publishing the book? How long did you work on that? It took me a year mm -hmm. of working on the book. It was a very long, arduous, rewarding experience. Yeah. And I had um, my son is a graphic designer. He designed the book. And my boyfriend is a, a master of uh, photography, editing, and he laid out the imagery. So it was a team effort. That's great. And um, I was determined to do it and lucky. To, to shift gears a little bit to more of a formal question, um, in your pictures I'm, that are up right now, I'm noticing, especially this one, that the way you've chosen to photograph these survivors, they seem very powerful. They're very beautiful and direct. I, y you know, it's, they're both respectful and direct. And so what kind of visual strategies, anybody can answer this, do you, how do you choose how you're gonna approach something visually in a personal project? Oh, I'm always very respectful to people. I would never um, not spend time with someone before I photograph them. About two years ago, I was at a dinner party and a very famous male photographer was sitting next to me who does portraits, and he just said to me, I never talk to anybody before I photograph them. And I was like, really? <laughs> and I thought, you know, I will spend as much time as it takes. One of the people that I photographed a shot, I was three hours in her house talking to her. And it, to me, it's kind of like the research part of it. That's where you really have to work hard to, to talk with people, to get to know them, to find your subjects. And the photographing itself kind of works itself out. And again, I was going to locations because they were photographed where they were shot. So I had never, I met people at a Starbucks or at their house or, for, you know, wherever, on the, on the street. And we talked outside or in that place and got to know each other. So they trusted me and they felt comfortable with me. Mm -hmm. But again, you're going into a situation, that I call it like a guerrilla portrait kind of thing because I never knew where I was going. I had no control of the weather because I was traveling. I had to be there. I, I could do three people a day. That was the max. And I had to go to the location and assess it immediately. What's, you know, what, how is this gonna work? weather, lighting, and the person itself. So it was, it was like a, a studio photographer would hate to do what I do, and I hate studio <laughs> photography. So I, it's kind of like part of the challenge of it and the beauty of it was that it uh, came together that way. Khalid, how did you, your pictures in this project are really, they're so graceful and they're very, Thank you. like, they're beautiful. Why did you choose to photograph them like that? Um, I. You know, I, I'm going to touch on, like, th some of the technical stuff for a second. Um, I struggled a lot with whether or not to photograph this uh, as a black and white or as a color project. Um, 
And I think uh, I there are again there, there are certain connotations sometimes that come with black and white, as if it's meant to over dramatize or even like other people. And and that was a concern of mine. I I'm always worried about the perception. Like we can't control how an audience you know perceives our images, but we can do the best we can to photograph people with dignity and and grace. Um, I fell in love with color when I went to Columbia. I'm, I usually lean towards black and white photography, but the color was so vibrant and so gorgeous that it was distracting to mm-hmm. me. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't want it to be about mm. that. Um, and for me, I think a lot of times I, I'm more drawn to pictures that are a little bit quieter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I look for you know the little bit of light in the shadow and, uh, and I try to, I, I like, Movement and I, I look for touch, just something so subtle and quiet that ha- that like your picture right here. I love this image. Um, this is the epitome of grace right here. It it's it's this moment that's so human and it's so fleeting, but it's so beautiful. So that's that's the best. I c- if Thank I could do, get an image like that, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, you, how did you take? What why did you choose the approach you took? Um, I think uh, I also like you know I definitely need to spend a lot of time with mm-hmm. my uh, interviewee first yeah. you know so get to know what kind of people they are yeah. and and then just like follow my instinct you know how I feel about them and then also I need to get a full like full picture of the story yeah. so I know what environment is important what uh, object importance is uh, other to shoot and I, I think I'm very sensitive to people's emotion change uh, especially with the you know the girlfriend renting story like there are a lot of uh, emotions going on like um, very subtle like the girl first got very nervous before she goes and then uh, you know like when they first saw each other they're this kind of like business partner but like still faking girlfriend mm-hmm. and a little bit awkward and yeah. the mom is very excited the mom even prepared this like red blanket for them to sleep together but they don't they right. can't so like it's this kind of a little bit awkwardness but like and pressure you know like mm-hmm. I, I try to um, just like give myself a moment and try to uh, let myself to sense what is the complexity of the emotions that is going on in the space yeah. and then try to find the corresponding moments that strike me with those emotions yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm interested in the black and white versus color question sometimes mm-hmm. because I feel like I have two vocabularies and they're like the project mm-hmm. about birth, I really want us to look directly at this. I want us to kind of feel like we're there because it's something that's so hidden and that we don't discuss in ways that I think are useful. Right. But then for the migration pro- project, I kind of wanted to cool it off and step back. Like mm-hmm. partly because of that like beautiful color and greenery and stuff, I was like, I want us to really think about this as a phenomenon. Like I want us to f- feel the people there, but understand that this doesn't just happen. There, there is a reason and the the history of US immigration policy is very bad and has like made a lot of these things take place. And so let's really look at this and think about it like symbolically and in context and in terms of like these, there kept being these these visual, like these walls and these connect connection things like ropes or like there are these visual symbols of like blockages and connections that really spoke to the symbolic meaning behind it because I thought that was something that we needed to like step back from the breaking news pictures. Um, that we see about that, like we have a visual vocabulary in our mind about what Latin American immigration is like, so I wanted to, th- I thought about that carefully. And uh, yeah, they're converted into black and white, like I shot with a digital camera. Right. Um, another question that I was mm-hmm. wondering for all of you is, so we're here on a panel of women photographers, obviously, you're part of another group of photographers of color, is it de- developed? Uh, diversify. diversify. Sorry. Um, so, and there are multiple answers to this question, but does it matter that we're women in your own work? Like, what do you, what do you think about that? Does your, and you don't have to just answer women, like your identity in general, does this matter? Do you get annoyed when people call you a women photographer or do you embrace it? What do you feel about this whole movement? Well, I think uh, for me personally, sometimes I get worried about being pigeonholed as a Muslim female Arab photographer. Mm-hmm. Um, there, I've, I've been having people tell me since before I began my journalism career, like, oh, you're so lucky because you have access to this community that not many people have access to. And while that's great, and that's something that I don't take for granted, um, and I have done projects um, that delve into Muslim Arab lives, and, and it's, it is an inter- uh, interest of mine because it does resonate with me, it's not solely 
the it's not the beginning and end of of my interests. Um, it's not entirely who I am. Uh, I do think that um, I mean I personally care about the photographer. I don't know if because we're having these conversations more often, but you know since before grad school I would I would see an image and I would need to know who took that photo um, because I do think that. For one thing, I don't think objectivity exists. I think that even the way we choose to frame an image, like we're making a conscious decision, like right, I do this with my kids. Um, you know, we're making this conscious decision of what we include and what we exclude uh, in the frame. And I think uh, our personal biases and our upbringing and and maybe even our, our gender or ethnicity uh, help inform those decisions to a certain extent. But I don't think that. Uh, while I embrace uh, being part of Women Photograph and Diversify, and I love that they exist, um, part of me wishes that we lived in a world that we didn't need them to exist. I don't know if that's complicated. No, that's, <laughs> no, like that's, it is complicated because it's <laughs> like a complicated. Rambling. Yeah. No, it's a complicated conversation. So it's I, I think we have to be. Answer. Sorry, I think Go ahead. we have to be very careful about this. I um, to the point where only certain people can photograph people like them because they they know how it feels to be that way and stuff. I, I think we have to be really careful about that. I think if somebody is a respectful person that they can photograph anyone at any time. And I get scared about the police that start telling us that no, you can't do that because you're not that kind of person or you're not that way. So I think we have to, uh, and, uh, but at the same time what you said is extremely valid about you know who is taking the picture. I mean but it's a, it's a slippery slope. Right. I think we have to be careful about saying, no, you can't do that, and um, yes, you can do everything. Right. I think my experience with this is, you know, when I was first started my uh, career in China, I felt like I haven't heard too much about, you know, like the gender equality thing because, you know, like um, we're just a little bit far behind. and. Uh, uh, and then I, I, I didn't really have that in my mind, and I just like go out and shoot, and I do, I just, the only thing I realize is like, yeah, I'm like the only few women in the industry because my uh, w coworkers are all men, and they do pay this special, uh, like, like they, they kind of treat you as the, you are like someone they need to take care of, sometimes on the field. Um, and I kind of feel a little bit weird about that, but then I couldn't really speak where, which part is wrong. Um, and then, um, actually, when I realized like the connection between the photos and my identity is after I, you know, have photographed a bunch of things, and people have pointed out that like why you don't shoot men's face. Like I realized like when I take go out and take many stories, even the uh, you know, for example, the um, the child bride, uh, child marriage thing. Like it is marriage, you know, is two sided, and actually, is actually men are in need of finding wife. Uh, and but like all the photos I shoot, I, like by instinct, I just like really I, I I feel for the women. I mean, they are the one in the story who got like treated as a commodity. Mm -hmm. But like I, I somehow I just like can be more connected with them, and that's like completely reflected in my photo because I have so many photos of you know them being as the real subject of the story, not the man. And I actually found it out why I was editing the story, and then I found out the uh, same thing with many other things I uh, shoot. So I think it's def so definitely, yes, my identity play a big part. Uh, that's how I that's how I approach the story. But um, I don't know, like, do I really think about that when I take photos? Uh, maybe not that much right now. I mean, right now, yeah, you know, in US, like, yeah, like this cultural context, of course, I have more realization of it. And I have this, you know, like my experience with this, um, you know, all this going on, like right now, I, I have more reflections on it. So, yeah, I haven't really. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? Uh, I mean, could a man have shot the birthing project? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it's totally right. I mean, for me, access. I mean, if I, I don't I don't know that a man I don't want to say no man, but I have photographed abortions. I don't really think it would be easy for a man to get in there. It wasn't easy for me to get in there, certainly. And the insider outsider question is so interesting because it's all a gradation, right? I mean, when I'm photographing someone giving birth, I'm also a woman. I, I know like a certain way of talking about it that puts everyone at ease. like language people use and when to be quiet and that kind of stuff. But I'm not the woman giving birth. I mean, I'm not, like, you're always an outsider some, to some extent. Right. Like, I don't know the family. 
But then on the other hand, I mean, it, right, so it is like along this spectrum. And then also, I also don't shoot men. They're fine. My husband is here. He's fantastic. But I just don't really <laughs> photograph men. And I was doing a project about when I had my kids, my first child. I was like, oh, God, I just ruined my career. I don't know how to align my identities as that I fought so hard for to be a photographer with this new mothering thing. So I did a whole project about it. And there are many of the families where, as in my family, the, you know, if there were... Uh, a man and a woman who were the partners, they were equal partners. The man was part of this. And I was like, no, I want to show that. I want to show dads taking care of kids. And the pictures just told me, like, no, they were just <laughs> not interesting. And so I was realizing, like, well, what I really am concerned with is, like, you know, how does a person that I identify pretty closely with, this woman, negotiate this career question? It just, like, the pictures were just very clear with me about it. Um, so it does matter that I'm a woman. And I think you know, when I was pregnant, I didn't tell editors. I was worried I wouldn't get work. I was worried people were going to see me as just a mom. And like some of that was definitely my own hang ups, but some of it was real. And then once I started doing work about working motherhood and more stuff about birth, I was like, well, this is how I'm seen. This is who I am. And it is a huge part of my identity. And so, yeah, I am a, a woman photographer. And like, if that's an issue, the, like it often is an issue, but I don't want to hear it. That's who I am. I'm strong in that and I feel really lucky that we have these sort of alternative networks because we're, as we're talking about Me Too and certain things in the photojournalism world um, that have come up so a lot of the way we get work and build community is through these like weird uh, sort of unboundaried hangouts where we're like all drinking but we're all kind of networking but we're kind of hanging out and the boundaries are super fuzzy and so a lot of really uncomfortable and inappropriate situations have happened I'm really lucky I was thinking about this for many reasons I have privileges that make that not happen to me that much. I'm married and have kids and I'm old. But also, <laughs> also we have these alternative networks where we can rely on each other in ways that like Women Photograph has been a really helpful resource. And like I'm being flip about it, I'm being light about something that's not a joke. Um, but I feel like that's really helpful in terms of being able to have these networks to rely on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely agree. That's what I think. Um, so in a few minutes we'll take some questions, but um, I guess, well, we, one other question we had sort of talked about insider outsider, one thing we really wanted to bring up was this idea of local narratives, like how there's sort of a paucity of local narratives. And so what did you want to, what do you think about that in terms of Oh, the that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Yeah. So the reason yeah. why I Go like it. got the, <laughs> like I came here to work as editor is because, you know, like uh, we have a lot of great uh, journalists in China uh, even though there's huge censorship going on, but then people are still trying very hard. But like then we still face this like language barrier. Many of those like excellent journalists they don't really speak English. So uh, and oftentimes you see the photos from China are shot by those few um, many times Western North uh, like uh, journalists. So like I just feel it's very important uh, to you know like to. And the narratives brought by them and the locals are different. Like you really can see, like, th like they're very repetitive topics being talked about over and over again when you see Western media. So I think it's very important to really have, you know, like someone who can choose and decide like story ideas and what news come to present um, as a local. And I, I don't really see that much. Like we, there are a lot of like, you know, like local photographers contributing to um, publications, but not many editors I see like working, like really working in right. um, Western publications. So I found this chance and I think, wow, that's great. And I came here and I try as many as I can to work with uh, journalists that who don't actually speak English uh, yeah. in China and help them to craft a story and like uh, translate the context. So like uh, the for the format I'm working right now on China File is like, so I help them edit the story and then they give me Chinese captions and read them in English and then I will write this whole article to introduce the journal like the news context and like the background of that journalist and the background of the story so people can from another culture can fully understand the story. So for yeah. you, a lot of broadening that pipeline comes from editing? Yeah. yeah. And Kathy, what kind of teaching do you do? Um, documentary photography. On, mm -hmm. on a college level or high school or what sort All of kinds pages? of levels. Um, yeah. I teach at the School of Visual Arts, my mm -hmm. alma mater. Mm -hmm. uh, in the summer, uh, South American student uh, intensive workshop. I teach in the public schools. Mm -hmm. I taught at the Fortune Society, Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center. Chinese seniors in Chinatown I had a grant for. So I 
teach many different people. I, I feel that um, documentary photography is a very healing uh, thing, a, w a good way for people to find out who they are, mm -hmm. come into their own. Yeah, I think that it could be possibly another way of sort of broadening the pipeline. I noticed that a bunch of the students at Bronx Documentary Center just won big, like, scholastic awards. Yeah, they're really amazing. That's I'm wonderful. biased, but That's great. <laughs> I'm teaching, yeah. teaching middle schoolers there. I was trying to pull up, uh, you, you mentioning uh, local narratives. There's something that um, one of the women, she's not Valia, she's not in the selection above, uh, and I hope that I can find it, but I thought that uh, what she said was better than anything that I could say. Um, because one thing I have to say, uh, just kind of, I want to harp on it really briefly, but sometimes people use um, the, the phrase, give voice to the voiceless, like no one's voiceless. Right. I really hate that, that's yeah. super pretentious uh, and presumptuous <laughs> and, condescending. And, and condescending and just awful <clears throat> and, and it's the worst. Um, and so, but what I try to do is just include as many quotes and excerpts from interviews as possible because if I'm gonna take the time to spend a few hours or a few days or a few months with a person and we go through all these conversations, like it should come from them. Um, anything that they say is going to be way more insightful and poignant than, than what I have to say uh, about their experience. So I'm going to, um, mm, well, it's somewhere, and it's somewhere deep uh, within. But one thing, um, I'll just, I'll paraphrase then. I will paraphrase uh, not uh, the direct quote. Um, but Valia was telling me, um, she, she started off as uh, a journalist and had switched to, uh, she calls herself a communicator now, and she travels throughout Choco, um, the Choco region, promoting literacy. She'll, have the, she'll host um, book clubs for children and women, and um, we were talking about it, and she was saying that, you know, um, Afro-Colombian and indigenous people, they, are, they have a presence in oral history, but what's written down, what's physically, literally documented, that's what we often value. And if we don't have documentation of these kinds of people, then what is that saying about how, how we see them, how we value them? Um, and so she, she talked about that and how she tries to incorporate more um, books and, and things that offer more representation so that when she is, I mean, I, I met her in the back of a coffee shop and she was um, reading to these little toddlers that were just kind of cr climbing all over each other to like look at the pages of her books. And, um, you know, she was saying it's, it's great that uh, these long, the long, blonde, beautiful, flowing hair and the fair skin exist, but what about like our version of beauty and what about um, the Rio Atrado? And, you know, it's not just like, there, there's more to it, and and I, and that's just something that I talk about with with, like going back to teaching. I just think, um, you know, even if my my students don't end up being photojournalists, I tell them like, you know, you can if you disagree with the narrative that's being told on, about your community or how you're portrayed, you can change it. You should change it. Um, and and also now we have these platforms where we, we can all self-publish at will. We have Instagram, we have blogs, we have Twitter, we have Facebook. We can, I feel like the world is just shrinking in so many ways that we can reach out to editors with our own projects. And, and our kids at the Bronx Documentary Center, they've been featured in the New York Times' Lens blog. And last year they had a container at, um, at Photoville, which receives thousands of visitors a year. And so that's, that's great. And the, the theme of the container was immigration because it's a really it's a prominent issue throughout the country but especially in the South Bronx mm -hmm. um, and it resonates with our students and with our staff and with me personally so um, I think local narratives are super important yeah it's like engaging with the documentary project in many different ways like as a journalist as a somewhere along the spectrum between journalist and artist and also as a teacher, and yeah, that makes sense. You had something else to say? Yeah, on. because you brought up with like, you know, we have so many platforms right now. We have Instagram. I just want to share a story that, um, that I thought about, about local narratives. So like during the human rights program. Uh, oh, no. 
Hello? Yeah. So yeah. during the uh, human rights program, uh, our teacher, Fred Riching, asked, like, give us a little assignment. You asked us to um, pay, uh, find 10 photos that we think can represent our country the most from Instagram. Oh. And mm. uh, I think his favorite work mm -hmm. is from our uh, fellow from Palestine, Gaza. And he found all these 10 photos about people surfing and the great food. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Cool. That's great. So that's, that's a awesome. story I want to share. I'll look through yeah. it. <laughs> With that, um, do you have any questions for us? Hi, person who just raised your hand. Do we have a microphone or are there different Thank microphones? you for raising your hand. <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, person who raised your hand, hi. Hi. So to repeat the question so that people who are listening to the live stream can hear, basically what are the parameters you give subjects before you start covering them in terms of their control over the permissions? So I'll answer one thing and then I'll have you guys jump in because that came up recently. Um, so when I was photographing, uh, when I photograph birth, when I ask people beforehand to do it, I say, we can have a conversation beforehand about what you're comfortable having photographed. So if you are, if you're saying, uh, nudity is fine, but I don't want my face in the same picture as my genitals. Some people have said that. Or photograph whatever you want. I'll say that to the time for that conversation is before we start photographing, and I'm really receptive to that, and let's figure it out. But once the photographs exist, I can't allow anybody to edit it because, and the nurses and the midwives and the doctors understand that too because they have a very strong ethical code, and I say ethically that would be not okay. I wouldn't be telling the story. So again, once the photos exist, I can't, unfortunately, can't allow anyone to edit it. And that came up where someone was nervous, an administrator was nervous about someone wasn't wearing the right scrubs. And I had to go back to that, and at that point, she really understood. Like, we had set the boundaries beforehand, and I also get releases. It feels weird to roll up on someone with a, a legal document, but it really helps everybody be clear on it, and I think it helps, especially when we come across as not apologetic or like, I'm sorry that I'm stealing your story. I think people sort of respond to us in that. And then with the abortion story, that the reason I got access was I showed them pre-existing work because they're really afraid of uh, who's the guy, James Keefe, or whatever, coming in and doing some like sneak, creep, underground photo uh, video expose. So to me, it was like pre-existing work and then just being really clear beforehand. What do you guys mm -hmm. have to say? Well, I know um, I actually had a woman a couple of years ago approach me. Oh, this one out, sorry. Uh, I had a woman a couple of years ago approach me wanting me to document her journey um, through uh, breast cancer and breast cancer and having a double mastectomy, and I've never worked in a way where the quote unquote subject approached me and reached out to me. She wasn't paying me. Um, we just figured we would take this journey together, uh, and I was there for it, um, leading up to portraits before um, her at the hospital, healing after, and um, you know she started to kind of ghost for lack of a better word, you know, she, she you know, just needed some time to heal. She would tell me she needed some time to heal. She was very open at first. She gave me so much um, access. I was just kind of dumbfounded by it, really. Uh, ultimately, I think that at the end of the day, uh, it's her life, and no, no project, no picture, no story is worth um, the psychological harm that it could possibly do to her because she is still recovering, and there was still a chance that it could come back. And I understood that, and I respected that, and um, I just had to step back. I mean, you know, I spent a lot of time on that with her, but ultimately, my pro my photos and my project and my ego is not worth her uh, health and her well-being. I think it has a lot to do with how vulnerable someone is, too. Right. Like lately, I've been photographing some undocumented folks, and they're very open, and they are comfortable having their names and faces together, and I just, I haven't published it yet. I, I don't mean to be condescending at all. They know their life story and their status far better than I do, but 
there is such something so vulnerable that I want to be sure there's not like an information asymmetry where I understand what this could be and and I'm like ruin a 20 year old's life I, it yeah. just you're right it's complex well, it's really we, complicated we have a, a, at the very least we have a, a certain responsibility to uphold um, I mean they don't owe us anything the people that we photograph it's it's a privilege to be able to, to drop into someone's life and be there f at their most vulnerable and at, at their hardest times um, and but I also agree with what Alice was saying as far as not letting someone else edit your work um, if they agree to it up front and and everything is, you know, there. You just have to be transparent. You just have to be transparent, and and each situation is different. But you know, go with your gut. I think that's the best. I would say. Yeah, and I want. I do think it's a very uh, important topic to talk about uh, because you know sometimes we we mix up. You know, we talk. You know, journalism and like documentary together. And I know you have background of like being a reporter, and you you are pretty much do journalism. I think there's an issue in our industry right now. It's like we are most of the time our work is published on journalism platform, and when your readers read them, they they assume that I'm gonna see a. Uh, object uh, like uh, reporting, like real reporting, but then like I know like many photographers when they start this like especially very long term project, they have these like connections with uh, their subject. I'm not saying this is not good, but like many of the times, your subject will think that you you are uh, their friends, and most of the time you do become their friends, but then if they see you are as a friend, then you will have this assumption that you are gonna report from a friendship perspective. Mm. But then for many of the stories, the, the how this uh, story is really like, that the story are gonna, like the way you are gonna report the story and how your friend is gonna hope that you're gonna report the story are the same, so you don't really see a conflict. But then there are also like very tricky stories that the way you wanna report very objectively is not the way that your friends want you to report on. So then when the story is published and then you suddenly ruined your connection. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and like, so I have like with this girl renting, girlfriend renting story, I have this exact like experience where Reuters gave me very good advice, but I think for many of you probably think will be very extreme. So the editor at Reuters, to uh, Reuters told me, first of all, of course, they're gonna let them sign the agreement. Mm -hmm. And also the way I approached the girl is you know like I met her first and I went uh, with her from Beijing to meet the guy. So the girl will think that I'm closer with her somehow because you know I have more communication, spend a little bit more time with her, and also like we are all women. Like she will think I'm a company with her, and she even asked me you know like when do I plan to leave and like if I leave is she probably gonna you know end her like end her trip right there together with me. So and then. My editor reminded me that you have to, with this story, you have to constantly remind her, like verbally, that I'm not your friend. And I literally had to do that, which is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Like I have to constantly remind her that I'm not your girlfriend, uh, I'm not your friend, and I'm like, I'm not on your side. So I hope when the time that I decide to leave, you just continue your trip, or if you don't decide to continue, that's your decision, but like, I'm not tied with you on this story. Um, with this case, you have to be this extreme, but for m most of cases, you don't have to. So I'm not saying that like you guys all have to do that. But I think, but this story, I do feel like if I haven't done that, the girl definitely, if she see this story, how it's published now, she's gonna be freaked out. And now like I've done all this, and she sees like she knows that I'm very very neutral in this story, and she won't have anything to complain. Actually, with this story. This is a thing that the like the mom, you know, hide this like red blanket. It's something that only the guy know and the girl didn't know. So one day we three walked together on the on the street and the uh, uh, guy just told me about this red blanket thing, not as a secret, but like somehow the girl like hear it and she asked me about it and. I, I wasn't sure if I should tell her because like this guy didn't really intend to tell her. I don't want to really like change the story because you know the girl might make some decision because she knows oh like the mom actually has this high expectation. So I I just like tried to not to tell her and then like she got very angry with me because she still after I repeatedly reminded her that I'm not your friend, I'm not on your side, she still think that I should share everything with her that I know in the story. And then she got mad at me. And then I see the, where the problem after like a whole afternoon, she got mad at me. And I said, okay, I think you are still having this expectation of me 
being somehow on your side and you really cannot think of that. And the, and when the story is out, there are gonna be many things that the mom talked to me, the guy talked to me that you, you didn't know about. And I hope you don't get like mad at that time. So, and yeah, so I think that's a way to do it. And it's kind of extreme. You probably don't need to do that in many, in many story, but I just want you to know, to know there is a, this it, like baseline here that yeah, it is very right. com complicated, I yeah. I think that with me, I always send people probably anywhere between 10 and 20 of the best images. And I send them that and I say, you know, you can do whatever you want with it. A few times, of course, they will pick a picture that you're not picking for the project because they might be smiling in it or they might be looking very cute and that wasn't the look that you really wanted for the image. So I've had people say to me, oh, I really like that picture. I thought you were going to use that one. But at all times, it's your project, and you make the decision. I'm friends with everyone that I photograph, but they, it's, a, it's just, um, it's your project. You're in the project. You will be in the project, but I will choose the picture. And there's no, I've never had a discussion about that, and I don't think that that should be. You always have to be in control of your project, and that you can be very loving and sweet and nice. But, but it's firm. it's your decision. Yeah. Nobody gets to look at the pictures and say, "Well, I want that one." Right. And I I, I haven't run into that problem. So. No. Yeah, I, I agree. I th that's why I say like in most of the cases like that. But there are stories like, f like for example, the other story I did like it's about this girl like who is under pressure of finding a husband, and then like um, I photographed her and visit that her mom paid to her mm -hmm. and they had this like huge fight I interviewed them separately and I cut the audio together so um, so there are a lot of tension going on between this like uh, generation generation conflict and the girl literally moved out like during her yeah. mom's visit and then like she's very happy of me like photographing everything and I totally her friend she shared a lot of things with me and like I'm like I didn't really think about this kind of relationship I just like you know follow my instinct of like being a documentary photographer as I want to like you build a really close relationship with your subject yeah. and then in the end of the day when I cut the story and you know added them together and she's she like she just like completely lost it like yeah. she got so mad at me she like even sent me almost like gonna sue me or something because right. she think like I completely misunderstand right. the relationship yeah. It's, yeah. it's complicated so we have time for maybe one or two quick questions, but you look like you have a question. Yes, okay. go ahead. Yeah. So along the lines of what you guys are talking about, unless you embark on a long-term project, it's kind of about to do with a family of immigrants from Iraq in the northern part of Quebec. And so you're going to spend time with them, but I'm going to be going back and forth. So the consent, the written consent. Do you want one when you do these personal long-term projects? Yes or no? And if you do, when's the right time? So the question is, do you uh, do you get photo releases, and when is the right time? And so I was saying, yes, I do, and when is the right time? I mean, it depends if I'm on assignment. I, it's easy to say my editor says I need this before we start. And then other people, maybe you need to warm up a little more. Maybe like one of you could answer this. I, in one, I would one more do question. it immediately because you're going to – can you imagine if you worked on it for a whole year and then the person says to you, you know what, I, I don't feel good about this. It's not, it's not a bad thing. I mean, there are photo releases that are, you know, one paragraph that are very nice. And I never had anyone say, I'm not going to sign this. So I would say, talk with them, make them comfortable, let them know what you're doing, but absolutely the release before you even start photographing. Uh, I actually need to wrap it up now. I'm getting the wrap it up signal. But we um, will be around, and you're welcome to ask us questions. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. coming out. Thank you, Adorama and Photo Thank Brigade. You. This is Thank been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.